few decades, it'll be a significant nest egg that you can withdraw from. It's sort of like having equity in a home that you've lived in for a while without all the hassle of home ownership. We can talk more about how it actually stacks up as an investment. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko, and today I'm joined by Brian Martucci. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm really excited for today's discussion. We have a lot of great topics to cover, but first for our listeners who don't know who you are yet, maybe could you start off by briefly just talking about what you do at Money Crashers and how you got there? Sure, uh, yeah, absolutely. Th thanks again for having me. Um, I'm the finance editor at moneycrashers.com. Um, we're a personal finance publication um, all online that covers you know pretty much everything you need to know about personal finance so investing banking credit cards budgeting um, a whole host of related topics i've uh, been on the editorial team for uh, several years now i'm responsible for kind of the core finance verticals um, credit cards banking insurance um, and work with a team of finance writers um, and editors many of whom are credentialed experts in their field so we have CPAs, um, former insurance professionals, uh, people who, who day trade for a living, um, kind of runs the gamut. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great resource um, if you have really any questions about personal finance at all. I loved reading a lot of your articles and I'll make sure to link that in the show notes for our listeners. So much cool, great cool. content on your website and I wanna jump into some tax advantage investing as our first topic today. So recently, we've been talking a lot on the show about what's happening in the current markets, what are the best investments right now. But I think sure, sure. just as important as learning what to invest in is how to invest in the most tax advantage and optimal ways. So I wanted to start off by having you talk about the two main tax advantaged accounts millennials should consider. Um, so what are the main differences between them? And then how should millennials think about um, and then how should millennials think about which to contribute to each year? Sure, absolutely. Um, I, can, I can definitely speak to that. Uh, so the two main accounts um, you're talking about for, for folks in the U.S. are uh, Roth IRAs and traditional IRAs. Um, and they, uh, it's kind of confusing. Uh, they're both individual retirement accounts, but they have some important differences that um, you should be aware of if, if you're new to this space. Um, so on the uh, Roth IRA specifically, there is, um, there's an income cap for contributions. And um, if, you, for, if you're a higher earner, um, you make over uh, about $129,000 a year if you're single or about $204,000 a year if you're joint, uh, a joint filer, you uh, can't, well, you start to phase out um, and then pretty quickly you can't contribute anymore. Um, and uh, a traditional IRA doesn't have that contribution limit. You can always contribute to a traditional IRA. Uh, the contributions aren't always tax deductible um, for your federal income taxes. There are income caps on those as well, um, which we can talk about in a moment. But those are kind of, the, the, that's kind of the big difference. You can't directly contribute to an IRA if you're a higher earner. Um, the taxation on these two accounts are, are um, is different as well. Uh, the biggest difference there is that your uh, traditional IRA contributions are tax deductible in the year that they're made. So if you contribute, let's say you contribute $2,000 to a traditional IRA in 2022, you can deduct that from your taxable income on your 2022 tax return. Um, and then you will pay taxes on the gains in that traditional IRA way down the road um, when you're uh, retired probably and, and starting to take distributions from it. A Roth IRA, the contributions are not tax deductible in the year that they're made. So you contribute $2,000 to a Roth IRA in 2022, doesn't affect your, your tax liability for the year, um, but your uh, gains down the way down the road are tax free. So when you take a distribution, you don't get taxed. That money is tax free, um, which is which is really nice. And any dividends in either account 
um, any dividends or um, distributions from whatever you're invested in um, that go into the account are, uh, are, are not taxed um, while the money is in the account. So that's why we call them tax, tax advantage. They both, have, they both have tax advantages. Yeah, we have lots to unpack here. And first, I just want to note for my Canadian listeners, a traditional IRA is quite similar to an RRSP in Canada, and then a Roth IRA is more similar to a TFSA. So those were great overviews of kind of the differences between the accounts. I think um, next, I would love for you to kind of go through different scenarios of how and when millennials should think about which they should be contributing to each year. Um, Should they choose the Roth IRA, the traditional IRA, both? Uh, Let's walk through a few different scenarios and talk about each. Sure, yeah. So I think we can break it down into um, three main scenarios and um, just blanket caveat here that you should always, you know, everyone's situation is different. So uh, please do, you know, talk to a financial advisor if you're if you have any questions at all um, about how to think about this. But um, the three main scenarios that you know we can really talk about here are one contributing um, everything to a Roth IRA, exclusively contributing to a Roth IRA. Uh, the second is exclusively contributing to a traditional IRA, and the third is to split contributions between the two accounts um, however you see fit so you know 50 50 70 30 um, and importantly for millennials for the, the uh, people listening to this podcast I, w- I would imagine um, we're all I guess if you go by the strict definition of the generation uh, definitely under 50 and that's important because uh, for people under 50 the contribu- the annual contribution limit um, to either type of account uh, or, or both accounts in total. Um, so any IRA is $6,000 per year. So you can't contribute more to an, uh, any of the IRAs that you have. Uh, you can't contribute more than $6,000 in a year. So if you have a Roth IRA and a traditional, you can contribute 3,000 to the Roth IRA, 3,000 to the traditional, but uh, that's it. You can't contribute 6,000 to both. You can contribute 6,000 to just a Roth IRA or 6,000 just to a traditional IRA, but uh, you can't contribute 6,000 to both. I think that I think that trips a lot of people up. They think the limits are, um, you know, for, for each account, but it's, it's for both. Um, when you're over 50, there's an extra thousand dollars that you can c- contribute to IRAs every year. It's called a, a catch-up contribution. Um, and these limits, they tend to change, um, not necessarily every year, but they, they do go up. So um, you can, bank that it'll, the 6,000 limit will go up, um, you know, at some point in the future. But um, for the, the first scenario, uh, we can talk about contributing all 6,000 or as much as you can to the Roth IRA. Um, you might want to do this because Roth IRAs are a little bit more flexible on um, how you can access the money. So we, they're, you know, it's a retirement account and ideally you keep the money uh, in the account for many, many years until you're much older, um, closer to retirement. But a, a Roth has more, um, uh, there are more exceptions, I guess you could say, for if you if you really need the money, um, when you can withdraw from the account. Um, so 59.5, 59.5 is kind of the key age. Um, there's a 10% early withdrawal penalty um, if you withdraw earnings from a Roth IRA before 59.5. Um, if the account is less than five years old. So uh, you have to kind of have to keep the money locked up for five years uh, or you're incentivized to do so. But there are a few exceptions that millennials are, a lot of millennials will encounter in the near future. Um, And the big ones are first time home purchase, uh, college expenses and uh, birth or adoption expenses. Um, There are also exceptions for disability um, and some health related exceptions as well. Uh, the first time home purchase is limited to um, ten thousand dollars, I believe. So that's you know that'll help you get to a down payment, but unfortunately, in in a lot of real estate markets, that's not going to get you your your full down payment. Um, but it certainly helps. Um, and so if you're thinking that you are going to you want to invest in a tax advantage way, but you feel like you're probably going to need some some cash for some big life changes in the near future. 
um, a Roth is definitely a good, a good tool for you to have. So if you want to max that out when you're younger and maybe your income's a little bit lower on the expectation that you're going to need it, um, you're going to need the money before you retire. That's a good, that's a good strategy. Um, and, uh, and then again, a Roth distributions when you're older are, uh, t uh, tax free. So, um, that is a nice, uh, that is a nice advantage. If you feel like your income is going to be higher when you're older. Um, so let's say you plan to keep working, um, way past 59 everyone wants to retire at 59 and a half. Um, but <laughs> realistically, most of us are going to be working longer than that. Um, if you have that salary income, that's going to bump up your tax liability and any distributions that you take from the, the Roth IRA are going to uh, raise that even more. So you're going to be taxed at a higher percentage on those and um, uh, or sorry, any distributions that you take in a taxable way um, are going to uh, add to your tax liability. So the fact that Roth distributions aren't taxed is uh, really is really helpful. Yeah, so I just want to kind of sum up a couple points. So with the Roth IRA, the contributions is one of the main benefits then of the Roth of the Roth IRA versus the traditional IRA is that the contributions um, is that early withdrawal of contributions you can fully take them out versus the traditional one you're more locked up. But that's right. Yeah, you, you also have more flexibility to take out the contributions. Um, that's the withdrawal penalty specifically applies on the on gains, um, so it won't be as uh, as hefty as if it applied to all the contributions. But um, that is still uh, yeah, that's a huge benefit. There's just more flexibility on how you can withdraw in general. Right, and I think that could be very useful for, um, like you mentioned, millennials who are maybe thinking of saving for a home and they know they might need that money in the next mm -hmm. five, 10 years versus it being tied up to when they're um, 59 um, and above. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. And then I guess the other main benefit of the Roth IRA versus the traditional is that um, the tax benefit is deferred. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's right. Yeah, you, you don't pay taxes on, you pay taxes when you contribute or rather there's no tax benefit to the contribution. But when you take, when you take the distributions down the road, you don't pay taxes. You're just, you're just done, uh, which is great. That can, that can be a significant benefit if your income is higher when you're older. Right. So you, your contributions are after tax so you pay the tax now mm -hmm. later all your gains are yours and you can take the contributions out earlier okay so yeah. i think yeah. that was a yeah. good yeah. summation of that one and then what about the next one so the traditional ira <coughs> yeah so a traditional ira is sort of like it's not quite a mirror image of the Roth, but um, it is a little bit different. The tax treatment's a little bit different, and uh, that's that's really important, I think, for folks, for millennials in the here and now. Um, your contributions are tax deductible in the year you're made with a in the year they're made with a traditional IRA. So um, if you're if you have a higher income now, uh, it gives you an immediate tax break uh, during the year. Let's say you know if you max out your traditional IRA. Uh, and contribute six thousand dollars this year. That's six thousand dollars in income that is not going to be taxed on your your federal tax return. Um, there there is an important exception to the um, tax deductibility of a traditional IRA, and um, we might talk more about employer sponsored plans in a little bit. But if you are covered by a retirement plan at work, so like a four hundred one k is the most common one, um, then the there is a limit on the uh, an income limit on your tax deductibility for your traditional IRA contribution. So those are similar um, to uh, they're actually a little bit uh, sorry I should say they're a little bit stricter than um, the Roth IRA contribution limit. So for a single person, if you make over seventy eight thousand dollars a year and you're covered by a four hundred one k at work, even if you don't contribute to the four hundred one k you um, you can't deduct your traditional IRA contributions. You can still contribute no matter how much you make, but you don't get that tax benefit right now. Um, if you're a joint filer, um, if you're married, 
it's a little bit more generous. Um, so if only one spouse is covered, um, if you're filing jointly, then uh, the, the deduction limit is about 214,000 um, on your joint return. If, what, uh, if both spouses are covered, it is uh, 129,000 on your joint return. So again, you can always contribute to a traditional uh, IRA, but you just don't get that tax benefit um, if, if, you're, if you're higher income. Um, but that said, um, it's still a great benefit for those who can, who can take advantage of it. And because there's no contribution income, income limit on contributions, it, uh, a traditional IRA um, is something you can always put money into um, if, you, um, if you want to invest in a tax advantaged way. Um, and we can uh, talk about backdoor Roth contributions uh, in a little bit. I don't want to get ahead of myself there. Yeah, I have a couple things I want to follow up on. So sure, sure. in Canada, you can roll over your contribution. So if I didn't um, put $6,000 into my TFSA or RSP this year, it rolls mm -hmm. over the next year. Is that the case for the uh, traditional and Roth IRA? Unfortunately, no. Um, you, If you don't contribute um, in the current tax year, then um, you just you miss your opportunity, which is, I think, why it's good to have a, not everyone can you know, afford to just throw $6,000 into an account at the beginning of the year and be done with it. Um, if you wanna space out your contributions, even every pay period, even though it's not coming directly out of your paycheck, um, if you just wanna set like a, an, auto, an auto debit to your, um, to your IRA, you know, every pay period and just divide, divide uh, 6,000 by 24 or 26 or whatever, you know, whatever your um, uh, pay frequency is, that's a good way to make sure you're at least getting close to that maximum. Awesome. And then I think the one distinction that you pointed out, uh, the main distinction would be that you get that tax deduction immediately, which seems quite nice to a lot of people. So if you're a high income oh, yeah, yeah. earner and you're looking to kind of reduce your tax liability mm -hmm. during this year, if you invest that money, um, as you mentioned in certain circumstances, you can write that off immediately. But what that yeah, means yeah. then later is that um, in the future, you're hoping that your tax bracket will be lower so that when you withdraw that money, you will be taxed at a lower rate than you would today. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. A traditional IRA is really, and you know, none of us can predict the future, but a traditional IRA is really helpful for people who are pretty sure or, you know, fingers crossed, but really working toward uh, being like retired, retired by the time they start taking distributions. Um, and I believe you have to start taking distributions um, at around age 72. Um, so it's, it's past retirement age. You can take them before that, but um, if you want to wait as long as possible so that your money has more time to grow. Um, but yeah, if you're still working at that time and your income is still quite high, the tax that you pay on those distributions from your traditional IRA that's gonna that's gonna be a significant hit. You're gonna get you know your your net is gonna be a lot lower than um, you would like it to be. So uh, a traditional IRA is great to to shoot for if you're you know planning to retire before you start taking those distributions. So what situation would be good then, or would make sense where a millennial might want to contribute to both? So I think the the short answer is that if you're you're not sure what you're going to be doing in 30, 40, 50 years, um, then it's it's uh, a good strategy to hedge your bets. Um, if you want to, you know, just split it right down the middle. If assuming you're eligible for both, contribute three thousand to a Roth, three thousand to a traditional every year. Um, that way, it's called tax diversification, where you um, you're still going to have a tax hit on those traditional withdrawals, but they're not going to be it's not going to be as big as if you would put all of your eggs in that basket. Um, so, you know, if, if you're not sure if you're still going to be working as you get older and or where your tax liability is going to be for other reasons, then um, I would say go ahead and, and split them. Great. So then you also mentioned the um, the decision might change or be affected if an investor also has a employee sponsored plan like a 401k. Can you talk a bit more about that? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So a 401k is a great, just a great retirement tool in general. Um, it's a great tax advantage account. Um, 
yeah, if you are if you are eligible for a retirement plan at work, which a lot of a lot of people are, then those income limits to um, IRA, the tech traditional IRA uh, contributions really start to bite. Um, but I, I would say if you are eligible for a 401k, you should think very strongly about investing in it in addition to your your IRAs, especially if your employer matches um, your 401k contributions. A lot of employers will match a certain percentage of um, contributions. Uh, it's usually calculated as per percentage of income. So you'll see a maybe 3% match, a 4% match, 5%. Some employers are even more generous. If you can contribute at least that uh, that much to your 401k, um, you will get an equal amount of money from your employer. And that's the closest thing to free money that you're you're ever gonna get short of you know an inheritance or <laughs> winning the lottery. Um, it's just, it, 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 it's sort of a no brainer. Um, the, those 401k contributions are always pre-tax as well, um, or I should say they're usually pre-tax. Um, there is also a Roth 401k where you can structure your 401k contributions as Roth contributions for tax diversification, but most people just stick with the um, tax deductible contributions, which is usually the default. So um, you can deduct whatever you contribute. You can't deduct your employer's match, but again, doesn't really matter because it's basically free money. Um, and uh, so I would say if you're trying to think about how to prioritize your investments, uh, your tax advantage investments, if you are eligible for a 401k and you have an employer match, your first priority should be contributing enough to that 401k to get the full employer match. Um, those contributions come right out of your paycheck. So you don't really feel them as much. Um, it's just, it's kind of like tax withholding from your paycheck. You're just your net pay is lower and um, again it's you know it's basically free money after that then you can think about do i want to contribute to a traditional to a roth to both and your next priority then should be should be maxing out your ira if after you max out your ira contributions um, you can afford to contribute more to your 401k then go absolutely go ahead because that's going to further reduce your tax liability in the current year. Um, and you can the you can contribute up to um, $20,500 in 2022 to a 401 k uh, So the contribution, the tax deductible contribution limit is much higher than for an IRA. And uh, th that number goes up almost every year. So it will continue to increase um, by at least a few hundred dollars uh, every year. So you mentioned that if you're over a certain income limit, you can't invest in a Roth IRA. However, there's a caveat, and that's the um, backdoor Roth IRA conversion. So that's can right, you talk right, yeah. a bit about who's eligible, when it makes sense to do this, and what are the potential risks? Sure, yeah. So um, a backdoor Roth contribution is um, a pretty common tool for higher higher earners. Um, to reduce their tax liability over over the long term, um, the way it works is you it, you have you for it to work you have to be above the income threshold to be able to deduct your traditional IRA contributions. So um, often the way it works out is if you are or your spouse if you um, if you file your taxes with a spouse um, are uh, uh, both one or both of you is eligible for an employer plan, your traditional IRA contribution, uh, deductible contribution limit is gonna be much lower. So you can still contribute to a tr traditional IRA, um, but you can't deduct those contributions in the current tax year, there's no benefit. However, you can transfer those contributions to a Roth account that, you, um, that you've opened and um, the money just goes into the Roth account and it becomes essentially it's it be, the tax treatment then becomes like the Roth IRA tax treatment. So you don't pay taxes on the um, on the distributions way down the road. Uh, you also for this to work have to be over the um, eligibility limit to contribute to um, your Roth account. And so it really does affect it, it. It's a benefit for I don't have the number off the top of my head, but let's say top 10 or 15% of, 
of earners, I would think. But if you're fortunate enough to be in in um, that echelon, uh, it's it's a real benefit. I will say there are some. It's not super involved, but there's a tax reporting um, obligation that you have. You have to file a, a form for your cost basis um, with the IRS when you make those contributions. And um, there are certain, it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly, but there are certain triggers that can mess up the tax treatment so that you may end up actually owing taxes on your your um, backdoor Roth conversions. Like if you do a, an IRA rollover from an old employer plan, um, that kind of gets off into the weeds. The last thing I'll say about that though is, is um, Congress has tried to do away with the backdoor contribution. It's really a loophole and they, you know, a lot of people don't like it. Um, so they've tried to do away with it in the past. Um, it hasn't been successful so far, but there is always a risk that the loophole will be closed and um, you won't be able to do this anymore. I imagine if, if that happens, everyone who, you know, who did the conversion in the past is probably safe but um you won't be able to, to do it moving forward or you'll risk uh, you'll risk tax penalties so now that we've talked about what accounts are best for each situation can you talk a bit about how millennials should think about allocating their investments in each account so said another way what types of assets or securities should you hold in each account and should they differ so for example in canada it makes a difference and it's tax advantageous for me to hold dividend paying U.S. stocks in my RRSP account versus a TFSA or a non-registered account because um, in the RRSP, they're not subject to foreign withholding taxes. So wherein, whereas in all the other accounts, they are. So are there any tax advantages like this in U.S. that investors should know about and would help them think about allocating their investments? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I, I think the the best kind of the broadest way to think about it is that um, in your tax advantaged accounts, it makes more sense to have higher tax or tax inefficient investments in general. Um, so yeah, dividend paying stocks are a good example. Um, and uh, I don't believe there's any any rule like like the one you just described in the U.S. Um, there may be that I'm not aware of, but um, the one you know what one example uh of a type of investment that you want to hold in your um, tax advantaged accounts is like an actively managed mutual fund that um, pays capital gains distributions that are then taxed as capital gains um, if you have that in a taxable account you you have a higher tax liability even if you don't sell the um, the mutual fund so it's good to if you have um <clears throat> if you want to invest in active uh, actively managed mutual funds those are good to have in, in a tax advantaged account um, a type of investment that you wouldn't want to have in a tax advantaged account is uh, so like a tax-free uh, municipal bond. So if you have state or local um, uh, bonds that don't aren't subject to uh, income tax, then uh, there's no benefit to having them in a tax advantaged account. You actually lose the tax benefit because they wouldn't they wouldn't be taxed anyway uh, in that account. So uh, though that sort of investment, which is fairly rare, especially for millennials um, who tend to take more risk with their investments. Um, but if you have that sort of investment, you'd want to have that in your taxable brokerage account. I have a quick follow up on that. So if sure, millennials sure. are investing in individual stocks and say they take a loss, do you lose your room if um, if you incur a loss? Because I know that is the case in a registered account in Canada, like a TFSA. So if my if I take a realized loss, then I have lost that contribution room. Oh, I see. Um, yes, you if you um, if you sell a yeah if you sell a stock for a loss in your tax advantaged account, um, you don't. It, yeah, it's not like a rolling. Um, it's not like a line of credit. Yeah, that that would be nice, but um, it's just yeah. Yeah, there is. Yeah. And, and um, you know, on the one hand, if you sell if you sell investments for a gain, you're not taxed on on the gain um, when you sell in the tax advantage account. But yeah, selling for the loss, 
you, you know, and, and you don't get to carry over that that loss. Um, if you sold for a loss in a taxable account, then you would be able to apply that loss to offset gains, um, and that that doesn't happen in a taxable account, a tax advantaged account. Right. So next, I want to chat with you about life insurance. A lot of our listeners might be wondering why they should even be thinking about life insurance at this age. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> but there are some reasons they may want to consider this. You've written a lot of great articles on this topic. So can you walk us through what millennials might want to consider getting life insurance for and who might it not make sense for? Sure, yeah. Um, it's a lot of different scenarios. Um, you know, every, everyone's different, but there are a few reasons um, that you would, you would want to buy life insurance as a millennial, um, even as a young millennial, like pre-kids, um, if you're planning on having kids. Uh, one is if you are uh, the breadwinner in your household or you contribute significant income to a two, a two earner household. Um, and that's especially true if you have dependents um, because they're going to rely on that income moving forward. Um, another big one is if you have jointly held debt. Um, so really common example is a mortgage that you've held with a spouse or is co-signed by a relative. Um, or student loans that are co-signed by a parent, um, or even jointly held credit cards that are, um, you know, have significant balances that would be a burden on on your survivors, um, and that even does include a like an apartment lease. Um, so even if you don't own your your home, um, it's not automatic that if you share an apartment with a spouse or um, you know a, a family that um, the landlord is going to break your lease if you die <laughs> at least uh, so your survivors will still be on the hook and that can be thousands and thousands of dollars um, if you die early in the lease so um, all those all those kind of financial reasons uh, are are strong arguments in favor of getting life insurance um, even if you don't really feel like <laughs> you're, you're close you're close to death um, it's sort of an awkward topic to talk about but uh, and also just kind of from a practical perspective, life insurance is, is pretty much always more affordable when you're young. Um, age is, is holding everything else constant is the most important factor in determining the costs, um, of your, your cost of life insurance. So every year that ticks by is a year that life insurance coverage gets more expensive. Um, and you know, it's not like it's a one and done thing. You can buy a little bit of life insurance now um, so that you lock in lower premiums. And then if you decide you need more, uh, perhaps because you know you have kids that you weren't sure that you were going to have, um, you, can always, you can always get more down the road. Um, it's also more common for um, life insurance companies, especially for younger folks, to just waive the medical exam requirement. So um, in the past, it has been pretty much standard that if you're getting more than a certain amount of life insurance, you're going to need to go through a medical exam. Now you can, a lot of companies offer like million dollar policies or even more uh, without a medical exam. You'll pay a little bit more um, in your premiums because the insurer won't have as good of a sense of your the actual risk that you present to them, but um, it can still be a big benefit to skip that, to skip that medical exam if you're frankly concerned about what it might turn up. Um, and life insurance companies are super picky um, you know, so even like an anomalous result um, in your your in screening, they can just be like, nope, they're not going to cover. <laughs> we're not going to cover you, or you're going to get a way higher premium. Um, so that's sort of a risk benefit calculation that you can make. Um, and then uh, the last one is just that funerals are really expensive. Um, you know, even a, a modest send off, you're looking at ten thousand dollars or more, probably all all things considered. If you don't have that cash lying around. Um, that can be a, a serious burden on, on your survivors. So then I'm wondering about the millennials who might not want to consider this at all. What would be uh, the characteristics of those millennials? Yeah, good, good question. Um, I think the it, it's sort of it's hard to predict the future. And my my advice, which, it, you know, some people might take issue with is even if you don't think you need life insurance now, you, you probably will at some point. Um, that said, if you're you're pretty sure you fall into one of the buckets I'm about to mention, then um, we, you know you, you, can, you can go without it. Uh, one is if you're single and you don't have 
dependents um, or significant debts, you can, um, you know, over time you're going to build up your net worth, um, especially if you're single and you don't have kids, <laughs> kids to um, pay for. And you'll just never, you'll never run into a situation where you're going to be a burden on, on it. Your death is going to be a burden on anyone. Um, you know, there'll be a funeral, but, um, that will be a manageable burden probably for, um, whoever is, is going to be in charge of that. Um, and, uh, again, even if you're, you're in a, like a partnered relationship or you, you have dependents, um, if you, if your net worth is high enough that any you know, your your death your premature death is not going to create like an undue burden on the household um then you're probably safe without life insurance although i will say that um even if you're a you know you're a stay-at-home partner or parent um you do your labor is valuable and um you know the, the numbers people throw around a lot of numbers but it's like probably if you add up all the especially if you have dependents um you add up the childcare component of that, you're looking at like a six figure contribution every year to the household. Um, so that is something to think about uh, when you're gone, there's not gonna be anyone doing that labor. And um, so it might still be nice to have a life insurance policy so that your survivors can more easily manage the financial components of your absence. What about someone who doesn't have kids yet, but they know they're planning to in the future. So what are your thoughts on should they buy life insurance now before the child arrives or wait until after? Well, I would uh, I would say it depends on your your age and your net worth. Um, that's the short answer. Um, the younger you are, the, the more time you you can wait, you can afford to wait um, because premiums will still be relatively low. Um, but at the same time, when you're younger, you're also likely to have a, a lower and maybe even negative net worth um, where life insurance will be really helpful um, because you won't have cash lying around to, to cover the expenses that you might leave behind. Um, you know, you can kind of look at it. Here's just throw out, throw out a hypothetical. Um, let's say you're 27 and you're, you're partnered up um, and you are thinking about having kids in the next, let's say, five years. Um, you could probably wait until the kids arrive, you know, let's say you're 33 and you can start to think about, okay, this is how much daycare is going to cost. Um, here's how much college is going to cost way down the line. Um, you'll have a better, your household expenses will make more sense to you at that time. They'll be more, they're more abstract when you're single and you know, you want kids, but you, you kind of can't, it just, it just seems like a foreign, you know, a foreign situation. Um, but on the other hand, if you're older, so let's say you're like 39 or 40, um, and you want, you really do want to have kids, um, but it's not, it's not imminent. And, you know, you're looking well into your forties, maybe, maybe even adopting or surrogacy. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a brutal calculation, but you might not want to wait. You might want to get life insurance now. And, uh, so that it's there when you're ready. Um, especially if you're thinking about having kids on your own, um, you, might not, you know, you're not going to have a second income to, um, to help out. And so it's all the more important that you have some financial protection, um, for your future, for your future children. Now that we've talked about who might want to buy life insurance, can you discuss the different types of life insurance? Sure. Yeah. Um, so there are two main types, um, term life insurance and permanent life insurance. Uh, and within permanent, there are several different subtypes. The, I think the one that most folks have heard of is whole life insurance. And then there's also universal life insurance, variable universal life insurance. Um, the, the biggest difference between term and permanent life insurance is that um, term life insurance has a fixed term. So you'll, you'll see references to like a 10 year policy, a 20 year policy, a 30 year policy. Um, usually it's between 10 and 30. Um, you can renew the life insurance policy after the initial term ends, but it'll be like astronomically expensive. So the vast majority of people who get term life insurance, they they just care about being covered during that um, during that term. You know, whether it's ten years or thirty years or something in between. Um, and if they outlive it, which is you know a good thing really, then um, they're not covered anymore. 
And unfortunately, the premiums that they paid into the policy usually just disappear. You don't get them back. You can, um, you can get a, what's called a return of premium policy where you get your, your premiums back, um, but that costs a little bit more, um, so that'll raise your premiums. For permanent life insurance, um, and we can, we can just use the example of whole life insurance, the term is indefinite. It lasts basically your entire life um, as long as you continue paying the premiums. Um, some life insurance companies will cut it off at like the age one, age 100 or even older, um, but most people, most people don't make it that long. Um, and your uh, permanent life insurance, your whole life insurance policy uh, builds cash value over time really, really slowly at first, but it does after, you know, a few decades, it'll be a significant nest egg that you'll be able to, um, you can withdraw from, uh, or more commonly people take loans against it. Um, it's sort of like having equity in your, a home that you've lived in for a while without all the hassle of home ownership. Um, so it's kind of nice. Um, we can talk more about, you know, how it actually stacks up as an investment, but um, it is, you know, technically a long-term investment that can kind of sit alongside your other, your other investments. So for millennials wondering, how should they decide whether to go with a term policy or whole? I know there's a lot that goes into that, but is there any key things that you can kind of just help them first think about? Yeah, sure. Um, I would I would say that uh, term life insurance is better for kind of the average millennial who is uh, planning a family or has significant joint debts that they want to make sure are taken care of um, that way you're you're covered for the entire term so let's say you're you're 30 now um, if you get a 30-year term life policy and you continue paying the premiums you will be you'll have life insurance coverage until you're 60 years old um, and that is usually enough time as people continue to work they get raises um, they pay down debt. Um, if you have a mortgage, you know, you'll be paying down your mortgage and you'll have a lot of equity in, in your home eventually, ultimately. Um, by the time you get into your 50s um, and 60s, a lot of people have a pretty high net worth and, and if, if they die, um, they're close to retirement, so they're, they don't have to replace very much income and they have a, a lot of money sitting around um, that I shouldn't say a lot, but you know, uh, you have a positive net worth that can pay for your funeral, um, can leave your surviving spouse or independence with um, an inheritance that um, they can use, you know, to sort of make up for your absence. And um, so that's why term life insurance is a good bet for, for most folks. Um, permanent life insurance is, is good if you, um, especially whole life insurance, if you want the extra assurance of having a parallel investment, like bucket of money that is not directly tied to the stock market, it has a predictable rate of return. Um, you can borrow against it. You know, it's like, again, it's like having a second house kind of without, um, without all the hassles that come with that. The returns on a permanent life insurance policy um, are not going to be as good over the long term as um, they would be if you just stuck your money in, in a diversified you know, stock market ETF and, uh, and waited 30 years. But um, that's, you know, for people who are more risk averse, uh, that's not really the point. You're not trying to maximize your investment. You're trying to make sure that you have that asset there um, when you need it. And uh, while it's not quite as good as a, a government guaranteed bond or something like that, or an F FDIC uh, insured bank account uh, balance, it is definitely less risky than, again, just putting your, your money in the stock market, especially you know, if the market crashes right before you need that money, you'll have some regrets. So yeah, when does it make sense for millennials to consider whole life insurance as an investment? Um, I heard that one way to think about it is once you've maxed out your registered accounts, um, then you could use this as another asset, maybe um, another way to reduce your tax liability. So can you speak just a bit more on that if it's when it's sensible for millennials to consider this? 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, a good way to think about whole life insurance um, is that it's sort of a plus investment. Um, once you've taken, you've maxed out your eligibility for um, all the other tax advantage accounts that you're, you're eligible for, and that includes your 401k. Um, so that $20,000, that $20,500 um, deductible contribution limit every year, um, that's a lot of money. Um, but if you're hitting that every year, then you, it, it, you should think seriously about um, whole life insurance because, again, it's going to create that kind of parallel bucket of equity that you can tap and that isn't directly correlated with the stock market. Um, so one uh, common situation where, um, where you might want a, a whole life insurance uh, uh, policy is if you have a dependent um, who will need lifelong care or support. So a child with special needs, um, a relative with special needs, um, probably not a parent because they realistically won't be around long enough um, to, for that cash value to build up, but um, definitely a, a child or someone in your generation um, that can, you can, you know, borrow against the policy um, to help support or even withdraw from the policy to help support that person and pay for their care um, without, you know, jeopardizing the equity in your home. You don't want to lose your home. It's a really difficult decision if, if um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be losing your home potentially. Um, the other use case that, that isn't as common is um, if you're going to be subject to the estate tax. So um, the threshold right now uh, for uh, the federal estate tax in the U.S. is about $12 million. Unfortunately, most most people, you know, never um, never make it that far, um, and that limit could decrease. It has been lower in the past, um, and it could it could be lower again. Um, right now, it's not a big issue for for a lot of folks. Um, but if you are fortunate enough um, where you expect um, to to die with assets valued greater than twelve million dollars, um, then your whole life policy can uh, be used to offset that that tax burden it's a, a guaranteed tax-free benefit for for your heirs um and they can they can use it the estate tax is really steep i should say um it's like almost almost half of uh the value of the estate over over that threshold i believe um so it's definitely worth it to do whatever you can to uh reduce that that burden if again you're fortunate enough to um to be in that situation and i guess what kind of returns um are you looking at when you're using this as an investment product? Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, it <clears throat> it's a little bit. <laughs> the, the short answer is it depends. Um, whole life insurance is really complicated. Uh, po every policy is is different, and there's a lot of fine print. It's not just like investing in a stock or an ETF um, or even a mutual fund. Um, and uh, so. The return will will vary. Um, that said, it is fairly. It's safe to say that after fees um, and expenses and commissions, um, pot potentially, that it's going. The long term return is going to be lower than the um, historic long term return of uh, the stock market, like the the total stock market, um, which I think, depending on how you calculate it, is you know between eight and ten percent. Um, but the the big advantage of um, looking at whole life insurance as an investment is that the return is very is predictable. Um, for whole life insurance, it is generally fixed, um, and it is while it's not quite as safe as um, like a government insured bank account um, or a government bond, it is much safer than you know picking picking random stocks um and uh and just hoping that, that they go up and, and and don't go down um so if you're risk averse and the idea of investing in um you know individual stocks makes you queasy then whole life insurance is um is definitely something you should look at i guess another piece i am wondering about is the ability to borrow against it so would that be um, that seems like it could be really um, a lot of millennials might like that if they're looking to make a large purchase or um, if they don't have a lot of other assets. Can you just speak a bit more about that when they could um, borrow against that money in the use cases? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the overtime, um, and we should we should say that you know whole life insurance takes a long time to uh, build up that cash value. It's like it's really slow. <clears throat> Basically, during the first, and again, every policy is different, but during those first years, the first decade, um, even longer that cash value is going to be really, really slow to build. Most of the premiums that you pay, um, are going to go toward the actual, the actual death benefit, you know, the insurance component. Um, and as a, as a sidebar, um, that's why whole life insurance is so much more expensive than term life insurance, because you're paying for lifelong protection. Like the policy is, is going to pay out when you die, um, because it's, it's always going to be in effect as long as you pay the premiums. And you're also putting money essentially into an investment account that has a guaranteed rate of return. Um, so the way the insurance company works that is um, it takes the premiums that you pay early on and puts them toward the death benefit so that it, it has more time to invest those premiums uh, and make sure there's enough money to pay your death benefit. And then the cash value is kind of like a bonus on top of that. Um, but if you keep your policy in force for 20, 30 years, um, you're going to have a, a pretty good nest egg. And, th and then the cash value starts to build pretty quickly at a certain point because um, it starts to, you know, compounding interest, right? Uh, it sort of takes off um, if you can wait that long. But um, you can use that money to, uh, you can borrow against it um, with within certain restrictions, but you can do anything with that loan basically, and it's generally tax-free. Um, so you can use it, again, as kind of like a home equity loan, <clears throat> but <clears throat> you don't have the risk of the bank taking your house if you stop paying the loan. The worst thing that happens is um, you reduce the death benefit. If you don't pay back the loan by the time you die, the death benefit is reduced by the outstanding amount of the loan. Um, there is an interest rate on the loan, uh, and it, it can it's not it's not nothing. Um, I've seen like eight percent, um, which you know is better than um, a credit card certainly, but it's probably not as good as you could do on like a home equity line of credit. Um, and uh, but yeah, you can you can use that loan for the proceeds of the loans for pretty much anything you want. Um, and you can withdraw from the policy as well. You can also, um, so, and then you can either top it back up or not. Um, there are, if you do that early on, um, there are pretty significant charges involved called surrender charges. And again, that gets really complicated. It's really specific to the individual policy, but um, basically you don't want to take any of your cash value in the first I'd say 10 or even 15 years. Um, after that, it gets a little bit more forgiving. Um, and finally, you can use the cash value of your whole life insurance to um, pay your policies premiums. Um, so as you get older, maybe you're um, after retirement, you're living on a fixed income, your income is lower, you can kind of draw down your policy over time and um, really reduce that that monthly expense that you've been carrying up until up until that point. So now that we've talked about all the different kinds, can you walk through how someone would think about how much life insurance to get? I know that there's a really complicated calculation with present values and a lot of assumptions, but I've yeah. also heard that there's kind of a short answer where um, using just standard assumptions for inflation, interest rates, um, and your paycheck, you can kind of end up with almost 10 to 15 times your gross income. What are your thoughts on this? Do you kind of have a um, short method? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, um, that's true. Yeah, uh, uh, and that's a great way to think about it if you <laughs> don't wanna bother with inflation calculations and expectations that may or may not pan out. Um, I, I'd say the, the sort of living dangerously um, threshold is 10 times your gross income. If you want to be a little bit more conservative, uh, 15, 15 times uh, could be a safer bet. Um, so if you make, let's say, $80,000 a year before taxes, that's um, $800,000 policy um, if, you, if you use the 10x method or uh, 1.2 million if you use the um, 15x method. That is, again, everyone's situation is different, but that's a lot of money. Um, or I should say, it sounds like a lot of money. It's not a ton of money in terms of income replacement in the grand scheme of things, but it's probably going to be enough to um, 
keep your dependents, um, you know, fed and, and clothed and, and maybe even cover their education and, um, and also address any of the jointly held debts that, that might survive you. Um, there's a little bit, there's a, a more complicated method that um, a lot of people like to use called the DIME method, uh, D-I-M-E, stands for debt, income, mortgage, and education. Um, so the idea here is that you add up uh, each of each letter represents uh, a type of expense um, or uh, income in the case of income you add those all up to get the amount of coverage that that you need um, so debt would include jointly held debts including a mortgage um, you can if you have dependents you can include things like child care expenses in there because those are really um, really you know hefty hefty expenses um, Income is your your gross annual income multiplied by the number of years that um, your uh, surviving uh, partner or dependents might need to live off of it, um, which it, you know is an assumption that you have to make. But if you're not sure where to start, ten or fifteen is fine. Um, then your mortgage uh, mortgage is such a big debt that it's usually considered separately. And education is future college um, education expenses or private secondary um, education if if you're paying for that so of course the dime method gets you a higher number than just 10xing or 15xing your your income um, but it is a way to kind of account for all of the big life expense expenses that you're not going to be around to cover um, and uh, so that can provide some peace of mind um, if uh, if that's what you need so the last thing that I want to talk to you about today is investment planning with kids. So for some of our listeners who either have kids or are planning to in the future, let's talk about some of the things that they may want to consider, starting with should they open a joint taxable investment account for their kids? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, great question. And I think that's an instinct for a lot of new parents um, who are kind of financially savvy to open an investment account for the kids right off the bat. Um, I would I would say you don't need to do that right away. It shouldn't be a priority um, when your kids are really little. Uh, frankly, you know, it's of no use to them for the first few years of life as an educational tool because they'll be they'll be too young to understand it. Um, kids understand more about money than we give them credit for. But, you know, a, a three year old is going to have a limited understanding um, of that. And the more, more importantly, um, well, I should say the, the higher priority on the investment side um, for uh, for new children is to open and fund tax advantage education accounts right away, um, 529 account or a covered L account. Um, and if um, you, we were talking about whole life insurance, um, if you're inclined, uh, there can be advantages to um, taking out a, a life insurance policy on your kid as well. Um, the the benefit of that is that it doesn't uh, count as an asset for them, whereas a custodial um, a custodial investment account will count as an asset for them down the road. That could uh, the fact that they have this this asset that has value could affect their eligibility for um, financial aid um, from a college that they're going to, and that can make a huge difference in your out of pocket cost or um, how much you have to borrow to finance their education. So um, I would say hold off on the, the custodial investment account until the kids are a little bit older. Um, if you want to invest on their behalf, the order of priority should be uh, education savings accounts that have tax advantages and then maybe a small whole life insurance policy. Um, if, <laughs> if and when you have kids, you'll definitely get a whole bunch of um, stuff in the mail about like Gerber life insurance policies and you can you can evaluate that when when it comes that was great well I want to be mindful of your time today Brian thank you so much for joining us today this was a jam-packed episode full of information I really appreciate it and I would love to have you on again to talk about some of these things further in detail yeah absolutely I'd love to be back so before we close out the episode, where can the audience connect with you and learn more about your work? Sure. Um, so you can find um, all of my writing on moneycrashers.com. 
um, write about credit cards, banking, insurance, investing, a lot of pretty much everything we talked about today I've written about. Um, and you can find me on, on LinkedIn as well um, if you want to get in touch professionally. Um, but yeah, this is great. I uh, had a great time. Everything I do is rules-based. It has nothing to do with my opinion. The point about the emotional aspect of investing is important from the standpoint that because emotion can be can be variable and can be somewhat random, depending upon how you woke up in the morning or depending upon you looking at the screen at a certain moment in time, it just creates a variable you don't want to have to deal with.